English, Espanol. Some time ago I made a video with the title I has hashtag addiction. Hace algún tiempo he hecho un video con el título Tengo adicción a los hashtags. So at the moment my favorite hashtags are Bitcoin per minute and now just some time. And this new one, Let's Talk FE, which rhymes with Let's Talk Bitcoin, but Let's Talk FE. Bueno, mis dos hashtags favoritos son, en inglés es Bitcoin per minute, en español también tengo una cuenta en Twitter, eh, Bitcoin por minuto. Y, um, Hace poco, ahora he creado un nuevo hashtag, Let's Talk FE, es un poco secreto. I watched many videos um, about this topic, Let's Talk FE, but, um, bueno, he mirado muchos videos sobre este tema de Let's Talk FE. And at the moment, I must say my favorite channel is of Mark Sargent. Y tengo que decir que sobre este tema de momento es mi canal favorito, el canal de Mark Sargent. Sorry, Mark S. Sargent, written together. Perdona, Mark S. Sargent, escrito juntos. By the way, my last video, number 64, is a remix uh, with um, a compilation of his videos. Mi último video, número 64, es una composición de varios, una serie de videos que hizo Mark Sargent. The reason why I want to connect these two hashtags La razón por que estoy conectando estos dos hashtags. I saw that in the end of the video, Mark Sargent gives his phone number. He visto al final del video que Mark Sargent da su número de teléfono. And of course, at first I thought of my own allergy against answering the phone. <laughs> Bueno, primero pensé en mi propia alergia de en contra de contestar el teléfono. Since long time, I have a dream to throw my phone out of the window into the swimming pool. <laughs> Desde mucho tiempo, tengo el sueño de tirar mi teléfono fuera de la ventana, adentro de la piscina. Okay, forget about that. What I want to, um, not just for Mark Sargent, uh, but many others who are doing a great job in um, exploring this complicated topic of Let's Talk FE. Bueno, no es solo por Mark Sargent, sino muchas otra gente que hacen un gran trabajo de explorar ese tema complicado de Let's Talk FE. Ok, um, just want to say long time, I have written on my to-do list to open my own channel of Bitcoin per minute. Bueno, ya hace tiempo tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de abrir mi propio canal de Bitcoin por minuto. Did you hear of Streamium, which is a decentralized system of um, streaming online video? Has oído de Streamium? que es un sistema descentralizado de um, streaming, que quiere decir uh, de ver videos en línea por internet. Later I'll paste a video from Let's Talk Bitcoin where they are discussing this um, 
Streamium without uh, using the word Bitcoin per minute, but uh, actually, in my opinion, um, bueno, más tarde voy a pegar un video mm, sobre ese tema de Streamium de Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, uh, actually, I prefer, okay, Streamium is the technology, but um, it doesn't express that it's um, the payment is Bitcoin. So I like very much the hashtag Bitcoin per minute. And it's not just uh, the idea of uh, streaming, but other um, applications um, which you can measure in per minute. Bueno, yo prefiero eh, la expresión Bitcoin por minuto porque no es solo de vídeos, sino cualquier mm, aplicación que se puede medir en minutos. Claro, Bitcoin por minutos. The most interesting um, thing about um, Streamium is that it's, uh, I repeat, it's decentralized, P2P, which means that uh, there is no middleman, so, um, so the content producer gets 100% um, of this, um, of the customer. Lo más interesante es en que El productor de contenido recibe el 100% del dinero del, um, del consumidor. And the content producer can uh, freely decide the amount, how much Bitcoin per minute he or she wants. Y el productor o productora de contenido puede establecer libremente la cantidad de Bitcoin por minuto, lo que quiera del consumidor. Of course, this is a most interesting, not most interesting, okay, the first people who will adopt this are these webcam girls and not just girls. Um, Por supuesto, la primera, en primer lugar, son los chicas de webcam, que no solo, no son solo chicas, sino también chicos. Because in these normal sites, um, the websites um, demand almost half of this amount for themselves. Porque en estas páginas web de webcam, ellos eh, cobran casi um, la mitad de esta, esta suma. But just before, I'll paste two short videos about this topic of, of Let's Talk FE. Pero antes voy a pegar... Um, dos videos cortitos sobre el tema de Let's Talk FE. I invented this hashtag Let's Talk FE because it's very difficult to, to talk about this topic FE. You know what I mean, flat earth. Bueno, yo he inventado este... Hashtag Let's Talk FE porque es muy difícil de hablar sobre este tema de FE. Ya sabéis lo que quiero decir. Tierra plana. So if you talk about somebody, or if you start talking about some, with somebody about this topic, don't mention flat earth. Instead, use this hashtag, ha, new hashtag, Let's Talk FE. Así que cuando empiezas a hablar uh, con alguien sobre este tema de tierra plana, 
no uses esa palabra porque te van a decir, estás loco, loca. Así que usa este nuevo hashtag, Let's Talk FE. So now enjoy these two videos and later um, about Bitcoin per minute. Bueno, que ahora disfruta estos es dos videos cortitos sobre el tema de Let's Talk FE y después el tema de Bitcoin por minuto, Streamium. earth subject i dismissed it without even giving it a second thought but more recently at the beginning of 2015 i ran across a few flat earth videos again and while looking into the fake moon photos circulating around i saw that people were claiming that the images from earth from space were fake as well pretty soon the flat earth subject became viral online and after looking at the apollo missions one night and coming to the conclusion that they were nothing more than a huge con game it jarred my memory about something and for a very specific reason, I decided to look deeply into the flat earth without just dismissing it blindly as so many do. Why did I look into it this time? Well, I do pray for knowledge and wisdom and discernment, but maybe the recent Apollo footage I watched helped. However, I live near a very large lake, Lake Ontario, and I happen to remember going to the beach as a kid and looking across the lake and seeing New York State coast off in the distance. I never ever thought anything about it ever, except I remember it being there when I went to the beach. Now, I've been to that beach a hundred times over the years, and once this topic gained more prominence in early 2015, the first video I saw explained the curvature of the Earth and what it's supposed to be in inches per mile. And it resonated with me because I remember that I could see clear across the lake to the other coast, something that broke all the sphere Earth rules. So with NASA fakery on my mind and the memory of seeing this coastline that supposedly was too far below the horizon for me to be able to see it due to the curvature of the Earth, I re-examined the Flat Earth Theory. And as unbelievable as it seemed, it started to make a lot of sense, especially since I did distinctly remember being able to see that far coast basically any time I was at my local beach. And as I've said, I've been there hundreds of times over the years. But even so, I went back to the beach recently and stood at the shore. I looked south and guess what? I could see the New York State coastline just like I remember. Now I googled the distance and it was approximately 36 miles. I learned what the curvature of the Earth is supposed to be exactly at that distance. And according to the people that believe in the sphere, I found out that the coast should have been buried below my ability to see it by almost 900 feet. That part of the New York State coast had a top elevation of less than 300 feet. So that left at least a huge 600 foot discrepancy. And even more because I could see some of the height of the far shore. Was something really wrong with the reality that they've been selling us ever since we were born? Well, I ended up becoming a little fixated on proving or disproving the concept. And at first, I truly thought disproving the flat earth would be rather easy. I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation why I could see so far beyond the so-called curve barrier. I learned about light refraction and superior mirages. I learned about perspective and horizons. I learned about how our eyes work. I viewed dozens of similar experiences on YouTube. I listened to experts and people who thought they had logical but spherical explanations. In fact, I tried for a few months to debunk the concept and just couldn't. The more I looked into it, the more sense it made and the less likely that the sphere model we've been spoon-fed since birth was a reality. It's just flat out wrong. And as more people shared their experiences and proofs online, it only added to my growing, pretty much unwavering belief that the world is not what we've been told. And learning about how our eyes work and how perspective work helps a lot with understanding sunrises and sunsets and ships disappearing hull first at sea and other supposed sphere earth proofs. I can't say for certain what shape the earth is or how big it is, or if there's an Antarctic ring or a barrier beyond it, or if it's an infinite plane. Maybe everything we theorize is not complete. 
There are so many possibilities that it blows the mind. And the flat earth has no real complete standard model because it's all based on us finding out things for ourselves. We agree on the facts and certain basics, but the rest is only hypothetical even if it seemingly makes sense. And as the evidence mounts for both the flat earth and against the sphere, I wanted to create a special place where folks can learn and share what they've learned with other supporters. Differences of opinion are certainly going to come forth and should be expressed openly. But remember that the goal of my videos and their corresponding threads is to provide the opportunity to use each of us to learn and grow in any area that any of us has a problem in. If there is a thing you can't understand, then ask. Someone will have an opinion and we can go from there. If you have a point to make against what is considered an accepted flat earth fact, please provide any relevant links or supporting proofs or videos. I am currently under the impression that the entire space program, even low Earth orbit and all that is there, is really just a sleight of hand trick by a group of illusionists that have swindled the public, the governments of the world, the media, and us into believing a lie. Everybody, a small group of corporations and cabals have almost complete control over the entire financial, educational, high-level governmental and media systems, leaving it up to real armchair scientists and normal people that can critically think and recreate experiments themselves to independently prove or disprove prove any accepted line of thought about our reality. Look, I ain't the smartest man on the flat earth, but I ain't no dummy. I'm educated and I never ever questioned or ever thought of an alternative to a sphere earth until this year. It never entered my mind to question this part of our reality at all, ever. But now I question everything. I'm a Christian and I think I see the big picture. Thanks, Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to see more proof against the heliocentric model and proof against the sphere, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you disagree with, Make sure you leave a note below explaining exactly why. Remember folks, follow the golden rule. God loves you. We'll talk soon. It's the 11th of July, 2015, and this is episode 229. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer -peer future. I'm really excited to introduce our two guests here from the outpost of Bitcoin community and one of the hottest innovation centers in the world, uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. I am a personal fan of their work. Manuel Arauz. Hey, Andres. And Esteban. Hi, Andres. Very glad to have you on the show. I know most people may not know the work you've done. In the past, we were first introduced in November 2013, where one of your first interviews for Let's Talk Bitcoin, as the creator of Proof proofofexistence.com, which is a site that allows for digital notarization of documents on the blockchain. And at that time, when our first interview, I immediately recognized that you were going to be one of the major influences and innovators in this uh, space, and you've proven me right <laughs> ever since. But this time, we're here to talk about one of your latest projects, or actually two of your latest projects, Streamium, a per-second micropayment billing service for video streaming that you launched to great reviews just a few weeks ago, and Decentraland, <laughs> um, a blockchain-based gaming platform, or let's call it at the moment, the seed of an idea, which I, I managed to play for a couple of hours last week, and it was a lot of fun trying it out. Thank you very much for that great introduction. And I must say, I also admire a lot the work you three do in the Bitcoin space. Thanks a lot for having us here. We've been tracking your involvement in the Bitcoin space. We are also huge fans of you, especially when you were in the Canada Senate audiences. That was one of your best works so far, trying to get Bitcoin to the mainstream scene. Well, thank you so much. Uh, next time I do that, I am going to broadcast it live on Streamium. So this is a platform that everyone's excited about, a beautiful demonstration of one of the latest technological innovations in Bitcoin, which is the use of payment channels to do micropayments. So can you tell us a bit about what Streamium is and how it came to be? So Streamium started off as a hackathon project. The original idea is actually from Esteban. So, props to him. 
we were getting together with a group of Bitcoin enthusiasts in Buenos Aires in the weekends and seeing what kinds of applications we wanted to, to bring to the world. At that time, last year, around November, I think, we were really, really excited about the potential of Bitcoin payment channels. We saw that the technology was in a really early stage. At that time, the only implementation was from Mike Hearn in Bitcoin J. We were excited to, to try build our own implementation and actually create an app showcasing the, the potential. So Esteban had the great idea of, of doing live video in exchange uh, for a Bitcoin payment channel. The original idea was to build the app in just a weekend, but it was impossible. We then continued getting together during the year, last year and this year in the weekends, uh, as we could uh, get time and get together. Yeah, it was kind of like a monthly hackathon thingy. I think our first broadcast was in February or something like that, but the app wasn't done at all and we couldn't show it earlier. Yeah, so it started off as a, a hackathon project yeah. with really slow pace. After we both left BitPay around a month ago, we wanted to finish this and, and close the project with a, a release. So we said, okay, what, what's the minimum thing we can release uh, to show to the world and we spent some time doing that we finally published and if you see what streaming is today it's a really simple and minimal app but we wanted to show the the potential of payment channels and luckily the community was very positive and gave us a lot of good feedback even if the app is is really a prototype it has a lot of errors and bugs but i think we we succeeded in showing the potential of payment channels in general. The reaction of the community certainly indicates that. I think having a look at Streamium, it encompasses two enormous promises. The, the first promise is the promise of micropayments realized for the first time ever. And the second promise is essentially showing what Tim Berners-Lee was trying to build back in the early days of the web, one of the proposals by the grandfather of web technology, if you like, Tim Berners-Lee, was a micropayment mechanism, which never made it as part of HTTP because there, there was no supporting technology. So Streamium is, is both the, the culmination of the promise of, of Bitcoin, but also the, the promise of a much earlier vision of how the web could be one day. I can see Streamium becoming extremely influential and potentially as enormous as YouTube is today. Can you tell me a bit about how one interacts with this technology? If you go to streamium.io, you have a form for creating a video stream or for joining a video stream. What are the components of that? Uh, how, how would one use Streamium? The Streamium behind the scenes has kind of like a in-browser wallet because we need to do stuff with transactions that nowadays wallets don't support like signing a transaction but not broadcasting it the technology that we are using so the provider and the client can connect is webrtc which is a peer-to-peer browser-to-browser connection we have a bandwidth limitation there because if you have a stream where a lot of people you need to have enough upstream bandwidth to provide video to all your users. And so if I'm a user and I want to watch one of these videos, what do I do? So let's say someone sent me a link and they've said, here's a streamium video that's going to occur. First of all, these are live, right? So I, I have to be there at the right time. But what do I do then? To create a, a stream, if, if you go to streamium.io, the form you see there is for the stream creator. You choose a name, you need to provide a Bitcoin address where you will receive payments from the payment channels. And then you set a price, a per second or per hour price. I think the form is set in how many Bitcoins or dollars per hour you want to receive. But then the protocol will handle all in a per second basis. Once you give all that information, you get a stream page where you get a link you have to share with your audience. 
one of the compromises we had to make to get this app published soon was making it as simple as possible. In that sense, we don't have a, a directory or any anywhere you can find the streams are live at the moment. So we rely on, on the streamers network and influence to, to share this link and to distribute the access to his stream. It also gives a nice property that the full application is decentralized because both the payment via Bitcoin and all the communication between the stream provider and the clients connecting to him are done via WebRTC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. The streamer gets a link, he shares it on his social media or on Reddit, and people, when they access that link, they get a payment request. You get all the information for the contract, if you would like to call it that way, between the provider and, and the client, which is the price and which address you need to pay to. And when you fund this address, the payment channel opens, the video starts going through and you pay per second. Esteban was saying a couple of seconds ago, it's not a, the perfect solution for people to, to connect directly their wallets to the payment channel, but we had to, to compromise on this because there are no wallets supporting payment channels right now. There's not actually a, a standardized way to do payment channels. So we had to do this in between proof of concept solution where you first send the coins to an address, an address which is inside your local browser. So you don't trust the funds to any server or anything. And then we create the payment channel from your browser to the streamer's browser. So that's basically how, how it works. You mentioned WebRTC. I know you're a huge fan of WebRTC and you see a lot of the potential that WebRTC has to decentralize and create peer-to-peer -peer applications of many, many different kinds. It's almost like a Trojan horse inserted into browsers that can now decentralize and turn into peer-to-peer -peer many common internet protocols. This idea really is that when you're using Streamium at the moment, if you're broadcasting a stream, there are no servers. You're not installing anything on any servers. You don't need to run any servers. You don't need to communicate with any servers. Effectively, this goes directly from your browser to the browsers of your audience, and the payments come from their wallets to your wallet. And that means that these streams are effectively uncensorable, completely distributed. They can occur in any country, and they work over standardized HTTP. Yeah, that's true. To be completely honest, WebRTC or the, the implementation we're using, which is a library called PeerJS, it uses a signaling server to contact the peers. So in any decentralized peer-to-peer -peer protocol, you need a way to, to do peer discovery. And we're using this server, which is a central point of failure, but it's just to establish the initial connection with the peers, and then it's completely peer-to-peer. -peer. So I, I just wanted to make that clear in case any developer is looking at the code and sees this. But yeah, I, I agree and I, I, I love WebRTC as a technology and I agree with your vision that it's sort of a Trojan horse that's getting peer-to-peer -peer protocols into the browser. The main reason browser developers are, are implementing and pushing WebRTC is for video conference and to support natively a lot of video conference and video media stuff, but it also has a really powerful data communication protocol, which is browser to browser. And I think we'll see a lot of new apps in the, the following years, leveraging this potential. And it's available in most of the commonly used browsers already. So it's a beautiful building block. And I, I think it's, it's really indicative of your vision of where this could go, that you chose to use that technology. This is a really cool project. It's really great to see an initial implementation of payment channels. Um, I noticed that your project is fully open source. And again, as you said, it's like you're just trying to kind of prove the concept. What do you see happening with Streamium? Do you actually plan to provide this as a, as a service or are you just going to develop it and then just kind of put it out there as a toolkit that other people can use and rebrand? Or are you planning to keep this as an open source project? Are you planning to continue developing this as an open source project? Or is this just kind of an, a step for this initial proof of concept? This original version is fully, fully decentralized and open source. It has a lot of problems right now, which is our main focus now, fixing all the bugs and getting the open source project to a state where many people can use it. 
and it's useful for the community. We're also considering uh, going full-time on this project and building an actual company and providing service for stream providers and content creators where we provide bandwidth to them. So the problem with the open source and fully decentralized solution we implemented is basically that uh, it's very hard to scale because all the clients are connecting to the streamer's browser directly. It's very limited to the bandwidth that the provider has in his connection. A streamer with 10,000 viewers, he wouldn't be able to broadcast using the, the current architecture for the app. We are thinking about adapting the payment channel protocol to support multiple parties receiving funds. We're thinking about implementing a service where you can send the video to the service and the service will broadcast the content to viewers in return for a share of the payment channel's income. Okay, so that sounds kind of like a Google Hangout solution where the, the broadcaster doesn't actually have an, enough bandwidth, so you're pushing it up to the server and then the server's distributing it. But you said something else there. Could a normal user who has a good connection act as a mirror or act as like a, as a, as a, I don't know what you'd call it, maybe a rehoster or something like that in that circumstance? Or are you thinking that this will be like, that's what your company's going to do? Or is it both? We are exploring that option too, to try to scale this solution in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Shemel, who is another developer who built Streamium, explored WebTorrent library which is a, an open source library to do BitTorrent protocol in the browser. He's exploring the, a method in which the streamer can create small torrents with chunks of the video and people connecting can see these files so that all the viewers are sort of sharing the, the load of distributing the video. We are still in a very exploratory phase in the project. We're really excited about the technology and, and the community reaction. So we want to, to explore all the possibilities. I think there's, there's space for improving the, the open source and fully decentralized version. We also think that there, there may be an opportunity to offer a service for a more centralized, sort of a compromise between security and, and openness and convenience for the streamers. We're exploring both sides, honestly. Do you guys see applications for this technology to be used for sort of like nearly real time live streaming of video? So, for instance, if someone's in a confrontation with the police or they're streaming video from an event live, do you think that could work? Or is it really more for videos that happened in the past to be distributed later? We want to focus on the live use cases. We think that with Bitcoin, we have a means of payment that is completely global and uncensorable. We want to get streaming to the hands of content creators that maybe have a lot of audiences across the world and they can't monetize on this. For example, here in Argentina, we can't get a PayPal account, more or less. <laughs> we need a United States bank account. And even if I wanted to charge somebody on the other end of Argentina, we would both need to have a PayPal account or something. There's actually no good payment solution for that. With the streaming, if you are, let's say, a YouTube star or a Twitter star and you want to do a an exclusive uh, premiere release of your next video. Maybe you can do it on Streamium the day before it goes out on YouTube. You can have a Q&A session with your Twitter followers and stuff like that. We think it's kind of like pretty cool to give this tool for people to kind of provide live video or performances. We're also thinking about musical performances. We've been actually contacted by many people interested in applying this technology to, to use cases. One is a friend from Buenos Aires here. He owns a bar. They do shows every weekend. He's really interested in, in broadcasting the show and charging a small fee to viewers. He was very excited and asking about how he could plug in the sound console from, from the show directly to streaming so that the sound quality would be really good instead of just using the, the laptop's microphone. The idea is to focus on, on live video and media, but as Esteban was saying, we want to take the frictionless 
permissionless capabilities Bitcoin has as a payment mechanism and take that to content creators all over the world, especially in developing countries where we don't have access to many of the financial instruments that uh, are available in the, in the US. And it's really hard to monetize content creation in, in these countries. I guess I'm just thinking about sort of social activism use cases or perhaps a situation where somebody's in trouble and needs help and they're streaming a video to let the world know about that. What about like approximately what would be time delay between when the event is happening and when the video reaches the viewer? How long does it take basically to get video footage to reach the world? Yeah, so it's basically instant. I guess you have the network lag, so but it can be a couple of seconds at most. It's a completely a real-time platform right now. All the bloopers, everything goes out. <laughs> yeah, at least for now. Uh, many community members have asked for this capability to be able to stream pre-recorded content. And I think it's, it's a really valid use case, so we are also uh, exploring that option too. Today's magic word is stream. That's S-T-R-E-A-M. Stream. You've got until the 18th of July to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. Keep in mind if you're listening to this on Streamium the day before release, you won't be able to enter the magic word until this episode is posted to the front page of LTB. talks about per second micropayments. I want people to really understand how low you can charge, how low you can go for per second micropayments on this. Because that's really, the, to me, the, the thing that makes this exceptional is the, the really infinitesimal scale that you can go in terms of micropayments for the first time. You could go as low as a few milliseconds, which would be like a a trip for the information to get to the other browser and come back. In this uh, payment channel where there's no need for a trust between the provider and the client, there's kind of like a shampoo approach to it. If the service isn't being provided, then I will stop paying. And if the payments stop coming, well, then I will cut the service. So you need to have a margin of error. So the packets, uh, the payment gets, gets to the other party. And also the, if in case there is a micro cut or something like that in the stream, you need to have some tolerance for that as well. For those of you who are not familiar with the details of payment channels, the idea is that the provider and the client exchange partially signed transactions coming from a two of two shared address between the provider and the client. Uh, these are all off-chain transactions, really similar uh, with each other. So every, every second or every 200 milliseconds, uh, whatever uh, you want to configure the protocol to work with, the client sends an updated transaction, which is really similar to the last transaction it sent, uh, but increasing the payment to the, to the service provider. The difference can be as little as one Satoshi. Remember that these are all off-chain transactions and only one of those will reach the, the blockchain actually, because uh, the protocol works between the client and the provider off-chain. The provider can verify the validity of that transaction and, and know it has received a, an increased payment. And in return to that, uh, it continues providing the service, which in, in Streamium's case is the video stream. So you have a channel where you get transactions from the client. The client increases the amount of Bitcoins that go from the shared address to the stream provider. 
that's one channel, the payment channel. And in another channel, you have the, the video streaming from the provider to the client. In any case, if one of those channels gets closed, either the client stops paying or submits uh, an invalid transaction, the other part can close the other channel so that you have a really incredible granularity in this economical interaction. So that's something that can only happen with Bitcoin. And I think it's one of the, the great potentials. It really shows the, the promise most of us are really excited about, which is Bitcoin as programmable money or the, the smart contracts idea Nick Sabo talked about some years ago. Yeah. So I'm looking at the calculator you have on the front page of streamium.io and I see that if I you know, wanted to charge $1 per hour, then that would be 0. 0.00000121, so 121 Satoshis per second, which would then come to, I guess, a little bit over two cents per minute if I broadcast for an hour. So that transaction would actually happen and it would go through with all of the various people or there are no lower limits? I guess the transaction fee is actually paid already, right? The transaction fee is paid when you, or at least it's, it, it only needs to be paid once no matter how many times you're doing this. So it sort of doesn't matter because to open a payment channel at all would establish that. Yeah, the least granularity that you have is one Satoshi per minute or second. I think that that calculation, the one on the front page, is missing. After yeah, so you, yeah. you have that payment for each second, and then you have to add the fees for the, the initial setup and the actual transaction needs to get into the blockchain, right? So you need to add the fee as, as with any other Bitcoin transaction. Yeah, only once, and it's a fixed cost for establishing the payment channel. So let's take a theoretical example. Essentially, by starting to watch a stream of this, or in any payment channel environment where you start to consume a per second service, you're going to pay two cents to uh, put the money into the multi sig escrow at the moment. In the future, perhaps you would have your own wallet to do that. It might be even less expensive to do it that way. And then you would also pay two cents the minimum fee at the moment, 0.1 millibit, in order to start watching. And after that, it can be as low as one Satoshi every second, or even with finer granularity, if you want to tune it down to 200 milliseconds or whatever you can allow in the protocol. And this can be generalized from video streams to consuming Wi-Fi to any other application where you can do per 200 milliseconds per Satoshi billing. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I have goosebumps. The world has changed again. <laughs> we, we are also really excited. And that's why we are really motivated about building this app and trying to show an actual use case for this technology, because we, we see this as one of the properties of Bitcoin that will really change the world. It's not only decentralized and uh, the money supply is not governed by any human or <laughs> organization but it's also money that you can program and and that's yeah. that's the the true potential of bitcoin in our opinion so this is kind of like opening a bank account with a complete stranger across the globe and the bitcoin acts kind of like a bank and says well if the terms of the contract don't get executed so one of these two guys is going to get the money tomorrow and while the payment channel is open, it's like writing a lot of checks. They will never be cashed out. And you can only cash out one check of all those checks that you write. So you can write one check for one cent and the next one for two cents and three and four and so on. The last one gets redeemed at the Bitcoin network and the contract is done between the two complete exchangers that needed no trust to set up this payment. So one of the other projects that I think both of you guys are working on as well is Decentraland, which both I think at least Andreas and I have had a chance to check out. This is an ambitious project that right now has a really, really, really basic prototype. <laughs> Can you explain Decentraland kind of in a, in, in a nutshell? Yeah, you, you describe it perfectly. It's a really ambitious project where we were dreaming about supporting the state of a 3D virtual world using blockchain technology. The actual prototype is very, very far from that. It's just a, a pixel grid with colors. But the, the interesting thing about it is that all of this is happening 
in a decentralized protocol and the state for each pixel and who owns the pixel and who can change the color of each pixel is recorded in a decentralized ledger, well, a blockchain, exactly like in Bitcoin, but instead of having financial transactions where people send Bitcoins from one address to the other, you have transactions that modify the state of the world. And in the case of this prototype, it's just changing the colors from a pixel grid. That's in a nutshell what Decentraland is. Okay, so you basically have taken what normally would be housed on, like if this was a multiplayer game, then generally there would be servers, or maybe you could have a decentralized server type of infrastructure. But what you're talking about here is you actually have a separate blockchain that you guys have engineered to hold the game state within it. And then as people play the game, essentially, again, it's not much of a game here, you just kind of run your computer and then over time your computer acquires territory based on performing mining. So that's actually what's happening though, is when people are playing, quote unquote, Really what's happening is their computer is mining for themselves. What am I doing when I'm playing this game? We struggle to build the protocol and all the app in browser. So it's also a fully decentralized app that runs in the browser in order to be really easy to use. What you said was correct. When you fire up the app, well, in fact, you, you have a, a switch you have to turn on, but there's mining being done in your browser. So you're not mining bitcoins, but this separate, completely independent blockchain where we hold transactions that modify the, the world state. So the key insight we had, or the, the key property of, of the central land is realizing that in Bitcoin, all the blockchain technology and the decentralized network provide a way to have a, a trustless proof of the state of the Bitcoin network, which is basically the UTXO set and more generally or more conceptually, the state of each address's balance. But in the central end, we use a blockchain to allow clients to compute a trustless proof of what the world state is. To make an analogy, Bitcoin transactions modify the, the address balances and what clients want to perform is a decentralized and trustless proof of how those balances change without trusting any central servers or, or other peers. And that's the same thing in, in the central end. If instead of calculating address balances, they're calculating the current world state and drawing that on the browser screen. So it's a really proof of concept app and it had lots and lots of, of bugs and the network forked every second. But it was a fun experiment and we're still dedicating some time to fix it. And we were planning on, on launching a new Genesis block in a couple of weeks, hopefully with a more stable network, which will allow the, the contents of the pixel grid to be permanent. One of the things that occurred to me when I was looking at this and realized that what was happening on the back end was that I was mining, well, you know, mining this other blockchain. Mining is a competitive game, right? I mean, like it's, it's kind of a game unto itself where having a bigger computer actually means that you're able to exert more power over the network because you have more power going into it. So is there anything analogous here? Have you thought about what it would mean having, you know, part of playing a game be mining? And do you, I mean, like, have you guys thought that far or is this really just like still a very, very basic thing and you have aspirations, but it's still very basic? Yeah, that uh, mining competition, there could be some gaming aspect to it. It's also fun to see there's not a lot of people that have mined a Bitcoin block, right? And with this, you can mine your own blocks. It's another blockchain, but it's nice that it has a very cool graphical visualization of it. Yeah, so it's kind of fun to mine your blocks because each time you, you mine a block, you get a block reward, which in the case of Decentraland is the ownership of a new pixel added to the grid. So initially, when, when it starts, it's just a single pixel and each mined block adds a new pixel ad adjacent to a, a previous pixel. So the grid grows sort of organically. Each miner can choose which pixel to, to expand on. When one of the nodes finds a new valid block, uh, this is a new pixel that the network agrees on having as valid. And then the one who mined that block owns the pixel, owns the private key that can change the color in a future transaction for that pixel. Of course, this, this is a really, really simple model of a virtual world, but we wanted to make this 
and see if we could get the, the protocol working and people interested in mining these blocks. And in the future, we have much uh, more ambitious plans, which of course we're looking to hopefully build a, an open source community to help us because it will be much harder than to just show a, a pixel grid on a web browser. I may have missed my first opportunity to become a Bitcoin millionaire by mining Bitcoin. But on Decentraland, I am a feudal lord in control of 638 purple pixels that I mined myself in my browser. <laughs> Tremble before me, mere mortals. I control this purple world. Well, congratulations on that. <laughs> Uh, it was on a fork, so it didn't really count. But uh... Yeah, I had 4,000 on a fork as well after leaving it on overnight. Well, you guys are the lords of that fork. Indeed. <laughs> that is your realm. <laughs> Unfortunately, that happened a lot. We have a lot of people sending screenshots of 10,000 pixels they own. Because we had a, a really stupid bug in, in reorg handling where if the reorg was bigger than 50 blocks, it just didn't work. <laughs> so, and, and given that we had so many people join the network in a very early stage, we had lots of these 50 block forks. And eventually everyone diverged in different blockchains, which is the worst possible scenario for, for a blockchain based <laughs> protocol. That, that particular bug is already fixed. and uh, We're fixing some other protocol level bugs. As I told you before, we're planning to launch again a new Genesis Pixel in a couple of weeks. Yeah, this may take a decade or so before we see games being broadly deployed on this kind of technology. But just like in-game currencies created a whole new level of gameplay with massively online multiplayer games with gold farmers distributed around the world, some of whom make their living playing in these games. The idea of a consensus rule-based decentralized blockchain to hold the state of the game is, is so novel and so beautiful. I, I, I can't wait to see uh, what people do with this. It really is another astonishing invention from, uh, from the teams in Argentina. Good job. Okay, thanks. Um, to, to be fair, the, the idea is actually not ours. I was talking about this with Jeff Garcik and Simon de la Rubia, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, on Twitter a couple of, almost a year back. And there's other people thinking about the same idea of using blockchain to do a decentralized virtual world. We just built the prototype and really share the vision. We hope that many, many other people are excited about this so that we can gather efforts and, and move this forward to a more useful game because right now it's actually useless, but fun. <laughs> No, necessity is the mother of invention, and I think it's really amazing to see how uh, in a country where there are no functional payment networks that can be used internationally, where currency controls create these really austere conditions in terms of commercial development, where young people are trying to find work and suddenly this technology offers to solve all three of the problems, just as long as you have enough creativity to redesign the world. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's very encouraging for us. We, we actually have lots of, of these sorts of ideas and are really, really glad that community receives them and tolerates all the bugs and problems these sketchy prototypes have. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Second Life. That got really popular for a while and it had its own in-game currency. I s assume it still does then um, for some reason dropped off. And I wonder if that had anything to do with the sort of centralized nature of it, that the uh, developers were making changes that people didn't like, and it was attracting a lot of attention from governments. I remember them trying to like tax the items in Second Life. And so obviously you guys are not going to run up against uh, those particular problems. But were you inspired by Second Life at all, or is it just kind of a combination of a lot of other virtual worlds that have come before? Yeah, we were inspired by some of the existing or previous virtual worlds, uh, Second Life or World of Warcraft. I'm a fan of virtual reality since I was a child. I've always seen this problem with centralized solutions to virtual reality, which are basically a company has the, the last word on everything that happens in the world and they can reset, change the rules. With a decentralized virtual reality, you have two other properties which are interesting, which are you have a more solid and secure persistence for everything that happens. 
as in Bitcoin, no one can change uh, blocks uh, very far in the past. And also it's an open and frictionless protocol where everyone can plug in and, and contribute and, and expand the features and functionality for this protocol. So we think it, the idea has some value. The prototype shows that it's possible, even if it doesn't work completely as we expected. We have a, a long-term vision of, of building a, maybe not a full game with lots of rules and objectives, but a, a really basic sort of infrastructure level protocol where other developers can build applications and sort of expand on, on the, the basic concept of just land ownership and decentralized storage of how the world look, looks like at a particular time. I'm looking forward to my first uh, notice of property tax owed for 638 acres of purple <laughs> pixel from Ben Lasky from the New York Department of Financial Services. Well, obviously you would pay that by sending him some purple pixels. <laughs> Beware of going into the yellow pixels uh, that are prison. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show is provided by Stephanie, Andreas, Manuel, Esteban, and Adam. Music for this episode is provided by Jared Rubens and General Fuzz. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. See you next time. <laughs>